great is thy faithfulness oh god my father there is no shadow of turning with thee thou changes not thy compassions they fail not and as thou hast been thou good morning today's reading is genesis 22, 1 through 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he carried carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and wood was are here, Isaac said, but there is where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offerings, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar and top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham took up, looked up, and then in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. So ends the reading. Good morning to all my friends at Faith Covenant Church in Manistee, Michigan. Dave Nesberg. Here to, uh, to talk again this week about what the Lord is, uh, is saying to us through his word. This morning I have the opportunity to, uh, to do the filming in Chuck and Nancy May's carriage house uh, on the south side of Portage Lake. It is a beautiful day outside and I can imagine the 4th of July just about getting here. But yet in so many ways it seems like, gosh, a long ways away. So many things going on around us and going on inside of us. And what I want to talk to you about today, the title of the sermon is The Dark Side of the Force. And what I want to talk to us about today is um, is how does Satan like to deal with us as Christians, to kind of manipulate us during times of difficulty and times of trouble, and maybe even just every single day. I remember a time... And I've told you a bunch of stories about when I fished in Alaska, and the stories just keep coming. But I remember when I got the call, I think it was the summer of 1984, 1985, I got the call from my friend Ted, who said, will you come up with us to Alaska and fish for salmon in my dad's boat, the Nike? 
And I, I was pumped because I, I had never been to Alaska and I was super excited to, to see the place and to, and to kind of show, show how tough I could be or show that I could keep up, you know, what I knew was going to be really, really hard work. And I said, well, what can I do to prepare? How can I get myself set? And so what he said was, get these little, the kind of like grippers that you squeeze. And he says, get a couple of those and just squeeze those every day. And I thought to myself, well, what does that do? So what I did was I set out on a weightlifting program. I started bench pressing and push-ups and pull-ups and curls and, you know, over the back, the whole thing. And I, and I think I got pretty strong. And I kept working and I said, I want to be ready when I get to Alaska so that I can contribute to the team as we're pulling fish in. Well, I remember one of the first really, really busy days on the boat. We were going 10, 11, 12 hours, just going constant, picking fish and throwing fish and pulling fish out of the nets. And I was going at it because I wanted to show everybody else on the boat that I had what it takes to do the job. And I remember by the end of the day, man, my chest wasn't sore, my arms were at sore, but my hands my hands, I could hardly close my hands. In fact, I began to duct tape my forearms just to keep it all together because my arms were exhausted. I didn't listen to Ted. I didn't listen to doing the right thing. And I worked on some different muscles that were of no use to me at all. I sometimes think that for us as Christians, we prepare ourselves, we, we do things to get ready to face the world, when in reality, God is calling us to some completely different things. Or Satan is coming in and sidetracking us so that we are never prepared to be a witness to, to the world around us, to be light, to be joy, to be peace. Um, today's story comes to us from Genesis chapter 21. And I I just can't say this enough. Everybody that's a Christian just got to pick up the Bible and read the book of Genesis. The stories are so amazing. But the story today puts us in a place where Abraham and his only son, Isaac, the son that he had when he was 100 years old, the son that he thought his wife Sarah could never have, the joy and the light of his life, the one who um, God promised would be, would be the foundation to, to generations of people that would follow him. Well, Isaac and Abraham um, are together, and Abraham has gotten a call from God. And God said, I want you to take your son, I want you to take him out to the mountain of Moriah, and I want you to go to the top of it, and I want you to sacrifice him in my name. I want you to sacrifice your son. And amazingly, Abraham heard clearly, and though I'm sure there was remorse in his heart, he set off on the journey. He got two of his, uh, of his servants to come along, got a donkey, and began and took off with his son. And they went out quite a ways, and they got to a point where he saw the mountain that he wanted to go to. He stopped, he left his servants behind, he put wood on the back of Isaac and he carried the flame, carried the fire. And they went for three days to the top. They went up to the top of Mount Moriah. As they got to the top, um, Isaac started going like, well, where's, the, where's the, the sacrifice? Because we've got the wood and you've got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide the sacrifice. They got further and further, and they got in. They set up the, the altar. They set up the wood. And then Abraham did something that I'm sure that must have seemed strange to Isaac. It must have been ripping his heart out. He bound his son up and put him on top of the wood to be the sacrifice, to follow God's command. Put him up on there. He reached down to take out his knife to take the life of his son before he set it all on fire. And an angel came out and said, don't touch a hair on his head. You have shown me, you have shown God that you 
Trust in him and you will do anything for him. And then they looked in the bushes nearby and there was a ram and they took that ram, sacrificed it to the God of all gods, Yahweh. Now Abraham, he clearly heard God and he unwaveringly followed God's law, followed God's will. In other words, he heard and he wanted to do. And I think so much, so many of us as Christians, we feel, we feel the same way. We want to hear you, God, and we want to do what you are telling us to do. But we're human, and we struggle with the hearing and we struggle with the doing. And part of the reason we struggle with those things is because we have an adversary, and that adversary is Satan. The Bible has a bunch of different names. Our society has a bunch of different names. The devil, but Satan is, is crafty. He is constantly prowling around looking for opportunities to throw us off of our game. And I want to encourage you in three different ways today. I want to tell you that three of the, the best tricks that Satan uses on you and on me to throw us off of our game, to help us to prepare for the wrong things we're going to see, to help us be ineffective in being ministers for Jesus Christ in the world, being lovers of humanity. One of the first things that Satan does for in us, in the life of believers, is he causes you to forget all of the things that God has done for you in your life. He wants you to feel completely alone, like, like you've never seen anything before, like God has never, ever helped you ever before. The scripture says in uh, Psalms 103, verse 2, Oh, my soul, bless God, don't forget a single blessing. Satan wants you to forget everything good that's happened, everything, every time that God has delivered you. He wants you to forget. And what I'm telling you today is remember, one, that you are never alone. Remember, two, that God has over and over and over again blessed you and cared for you and loved you in such amazing ways. I want to encourage you to, to write down some of the blessings that you see as they're happening. Write them down, put them into your phone, put them someplace so that you can remember. In Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter four, Joshua says, I want you to go into the Jordan River and I want you to grab stones out of this river and I want you to make a monument. So every time you see these stones, you will remember the great blessing that God did when he stopped up the Jordan River so that the people could cross. I want you to remember what God has done. And don't ever let yourself feel like you're alone. I mean, I think about myself, the hundreds of times God has delivered me. Just a few days ago, I was down at our building house and I was unloading some stuff and I was gonna undo a bungee cord. And I undid the bungee cord and it shot out and it hit me right next to the eye. I mean, literally this far from my eyeball, and I, and I, I literally went blind for a second. I just up and, and I was bleeding, and I said, what in the world happened? And I know for a fact that God was there for me at, there for me at that moment, at that time. How about you? Can you remember those times when God has been there for you? Keep remembering those. A second thing that Satan does in, in believers, to throw us off base, especially during this time of, 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 of chaotic things going on around us. He causes us to be fearful. He causes you and I to be afraid. Um, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 4 says this. Tell fearful souls, courage, take heart. God is here, right here, on his way to put things right and redress all wrongs. He's on his way. He will save you. 
be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Satan comes into our lives and wants to make us afraid. I remember when I was offered the job at Portage Lake Bible Camp, and I was wondering whether I was going to take it, and then I thought to myself, I'm going to have to do a lot of public speaking. I'm going to have to get up in front and represent all these things that are going on at camp and all these people on staff. I said, I can't do that. Uh, it scares the heck out of me. If the, it, I can't. If I would have listened to that fearful voice, I never would have been able to have 24 years of ministry where God blessed me over and over and over again despite my weaknesses. If I was fearful, I would not have done that. I would have stuck with something simple and something safe. And I want to encourage you to be, to be brave, to be courageous. Are you afraid of, of change? Because change is always happening. You need to be brave in times of change. Are you afraid to reach out to the people that are around you? Just give it a try. Just step out a tiny bit, just one degree difference, one little spot. Are you afraid of what Satan might do to you if he sees that you're being effective? Kids say that all the time at camp. You have nothing to fear from Satan when God is protecting you and guiding you. Are you afraid to speak out when one of your friends posts or says something that, that's just wrong? Are you afraid to say what you're feeling prompted to say by God? Well, that's Satan working on you. He wants you to forget he wants you to be fearful. He wants you to be fearful. He, Satan wants you to always be fearful, but God wants you to be strong and courageous. And a final thing that I believe Satan likes to do in the life of Christians to throw us off of our game is that he tries to make us feel that feelings indicate how close we are to him that everything is based upon feelings. And if I feel far away, if I feel out of sorts, that I am far away from God, that I am out of step, that I am out of line. And I want you to understand something. We don't believe in a God because of feelings. We don't, uh, we don't allow feelings to dictate who and what we are. We believe in the God of truth and the God that is an absolute fact. We believe in truth and we don't believe, let feelings drift us right or drift us left. I don't know about you guys, but living in northern Michigan with the number of gray days we have in the winter, there's some days I start feeling down. And if I thought that was how, how close I was to God, I'd feel like I was away from God quite a bit. Satan comes in and tries to attack your feelings. I remember when I was in Alaska um, at our Covenant Bible Camp just a few years ago. And it was really, really early in the year and we were going to move some canoes to another side of camp. And as we got to an open part of, uh, open part of water, we, we paddled for a while. And then there's a little frozen patch. And I looked at the frozen patch and I said, well, I feel like we can make it through there. I feel like we can do it. And the person I was with, this other woman, she looked at me and she goes, what? Why? I said, I just feel like we can do it. So we went, we paddled up onto the ice and got in the front of the boat, kind of broke it, got, took the paddle again, went up on the ice and broke it and went up at the front. And then we couldn't break it anymore. And then we started realizing that we were stuck in this ice flow with a boat and my feelings were wrong. I had no reason to feel like we could make it through there. And why we depended on my feelings at that time, we had to get help, but some folks came out and they rescued us. But I think about that all the time. I think about how I can't always follow my feelings. I can't always believe that my feelings are indicating how I should, how close I am to God, indicating to me how, um, how I should proceed. Feelings are important, but oftentimes feelings can be, can be misleading. Philippians 1, 9 and 10 says this, you need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. 
That's from the message. You need to use your head to test your feelings so that your love is sincere and, an in and intelligent and not sentimental gush. Satan says to you this. He says, forget all the things that God has done for you. And I say to you, remember all of the things that God has done for you over and over again. Remember those things. Tell people. Write them down so that when you come to a difficult place, you remember the God who is with you and the God who was with Abraham when he was about to sacrifice his son. But Abraham trusted God. Remember that Satan tries to make you fearful and I want you to be courageous and strong. I want you to step just a little beyond where you feel comfortable in the name of Jesus, in a way of love and of care. Look at his word. Ask your pastor, ask your Christian friends how you can move forward without fear. Do it together. Be it together as a team, as a wall together. And then finally, do not allow your feelings, your feelings of inadequacy, your feelings of what you think should happen, don't let your feelings get in the way of you believing and knowing how close you are to God and how capable you are. Never let your feelings dictate how you respond or how you act as a Christian in your day-to-day -day lives. Man, the pandemic is still going on. We're still trying to address and confront racial wounds that our country has suffered for, for generations. But there are good things happening as well. God is at work. Last week I had my Zoom with my friends and I love my friends. We never would have done this outside of this. I, I got a call from a friend who's a pastor in downtown Detroit, just kind of out of the blue. And it was awesome, and I felt so amazing. I, I'm getting calls from my family members as we touch base. Issues in our country are being addressed for the first time in a real way. God is doing amazing things. The God of the universe is still alive and active. I encourage you to be, to never forget, to be strong and courageous. And to remember that your feelings are a real poor indicator of how close you are to God. This week, um, be the hands and the feet of Jesus. In the holy name we pray. In the holy name I pray for you.